Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. On March 21st, 2021, thousands entered the streets of Bristol in the UK to vent their anger at the deaths in police custody, police violence on the streets, and the slate of oppressive laws, including the Spy Cops Bill, increasing the impunity for government officials breaking their laws, as well as the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, known simply as the Bill, which targets Roma and Traveler people, lengthens youth prison sentences, and among other things, criminalizes dissent and protest amidst one of the harshest COVID-19 lockdowns in the UK. What became known as the Kill the Bill riot led to running fights with police, burnt cop cars, a dizzying disinformation campaign by police centering on themselves, centering themselves as victims, and over 80 people arrested to date, with more being detained, ongoing, and some facing years in prison. From Monday the 25th through Wednesday the 27th of October, defendant Ryan Roberts is facing trial and is calling for international solidarity. So for the hour, Tom and Nicole of Bristol Anarchist Black Cross talk about the Kill the Bill riot, police violence in the UK, the radical scene in Bristol, anti-repression work of Bristol ABC and the Bristol Defendant Solidarity Crew, the legacy of former Bristol resident Anna Campbell, the cases of the Colston Four, as well as that of Toby Schoen, prison expansion in the UK, and a bunch more. To learn more about their work and how to support and write to Ryan Roberts and other Kill the Bill defendants, visit bristolabc.wordpress.com. And you can search also for the the hashtag killthebill on social media for demo information in your area to join in on or to advertise your solidarity action. If you happen to be in Manchester, we just heard tell that there is a demo on the 27th at 5 p.m. at the Crown Court. You can check our show notes for more links, including our conversation with Donald O'Driscoll from November of 2020 about the Spy Cops case. There's also a new podcast out called Spy Cops Info that includes folks who have been a part of groups that were infiltrated by undercover pigs in the UK in the past decades, talking about individual cops and the ongoing inquiry that's worth giving a listen to. Now here are a couple of announcements. There's a really cool poster available in solidarity with anarchist and anti-fascist prisoner Eric King, who is facing trial in a Denver court on a frame-up right now from inside of the Bureau of Prisons. The poster was produced by Radix Media, and here's what they have to say. Quote, To support Eric King, we're releasing a limited edition of 35 posters carrying one of his revolutionary poems. All profits generated from the sale of this broadside will be sent to Eric's support fund. The print is approximately 12 and a half by 20 inches and was letter press printed in multiple passes on our vintage Vandercook proofing press. Unquote. You can find the poster at radixmedia.org slash product slash Eric hyphen King hyphen support hyphen letterpress hyphen broadside or linked in our show notes. If you don't want to type all that out. Finally, Sean Swain is in danger of being out of state transferred again to who knows where. His support crew are asking that folks call Ohio State Senator Teresa Fedor and Ohio State Representative Lisa A. Sobechki to express concern about Sean's safety, access to his legal counsel as well as his family and support network in Ohio, and to question the legality of sending Sean out of state without the legally required hearing with Sean in attendance, which they skipped when they sent him to Virginia in 2019. You can check out seanswain.org for a basic script for calling these two state officials. If you're returning to these notes to find Sean's segment, good on ya. It's in the current iteration of the show and can be found on its own linked in the show notes. I'm Nicole, uh, use she, her pronouns. I've been kind of living in or around Bristol for nearly 30 years. And yeah, I organize with Bristol Anarchist Black Cross. And I'm Tom. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a relative newcomer to Bristol and I've been a defendant in, in trials myself and, um, and have, have done anti-repression work for, uh, for comrades for, for quite a few years too. And I'm part of Bristol Anarchist Black Cross. Thank you both so much for coming on and, and being willing to talk. I really appreciate it. Could you tell us a bit about 
about Bristol, uh, maybe where it's at and its measurements, who lives there and what it's like and what it was like in the run up to the Kill the Bill demos. Yeah, so Bristol is a city in southwest England. It's under half a million people live there. Pretty diverse in terms of like class and race. So over a quarter of the people in Bristol are not white. There's a really large like Afro-Caribbean community. Um, and there's like a really long history, you know, like there's a long history everywhere of police violence, but there's quite a long history of, of rioting Some... and resistance and community organising in Bristol. It's kind of like the 11th biggest city in the UK. And uh, <laughs> thankfully, the Times dubbed it as like one of the best places to live in the UK. But that means there's been like really increasing gentrification every year. Um, people are kind of attracted to the city because there's like quite a lot of underground music scene, street art, this kind of like alternative culture. But it kind of sits in like a very rural region of England. And yeah, and I guess just in terms of like the historical context, like the city was like built on the slave trade it's by the sea on the west coast so yeah there's like a long a long history of like slavery in the city and yeah and yeah in terms of in terms of kind of like local riots like we're going to be talking about a recent riot that happened in March this year but there is this kind of like historical context to that in terms of uh, riots in like the centre of Bristol and places like St Paul's um, which have happened after like police have really like abused stop and search powers where they've killed people. Um, and there was like a kind of famous riot in 2011 after like a big squat eviction in the city. And yeah, and just in terms of like what we're talking about today. So if people aren't aware, there was like a riot in, in March, March 21st against um, some new legislation that we're going to be talking about. And a lot of people have been arrested, 81 people so far, 41 people have been charged, and there's already 10 people in prison. But we'll, you know, we'll go into that more, like, over the next hour. Cool. And would you all talk a bit about Bristol ABC, about um, Bristol Defendant Solidarity and the anti-repression work that those two groups do? So there's two groups. So we're, like, representing Bristol Anarchist Black Cross, um, and there's also a group called Bristol Defendant Solidarity and BDS, the Bristol Defendant Solidarity, was started after this riot in 2011. But kind of before then, there's always been like ongoing, like informal support and solidarity for people that are arrested. Like BDS, like mostly focuses on defendant support work and ABC focuses more on like the prisoner side. Um, but recently, with all the repression, we've been like working really closely together and in terms of Bristol ABC, like, you know, if people aren't aware of the anarchist Black Cross, it, you know, there, you know, it's debated like how it started, but there are like, there is evidence that it was active in 1905 in Russia. And there's like ABC groups all over the world that are active supporting people in prison. So I've been doing ABC for about 10 years now. And we've been like supporting people practically, financially, politically, uh, not just in the UK, but also like around the world. So yeah, so Bristol was kind of fortunate with the riots that like there was a lot of infrastructure that was already established that could respond to the situation. There was also groups that kind of like got started in the in the midst of it all. So there's like a action medic crew that was set up and legal observers kind of like independently organized to attend the demos. And so like what happened, you know, there was obviously this like mass arrest of people and some people, you know, were known to us, were comrades, were kind of in our communities already and other people weren't. And so uh, BDS had to like really kind of publicise the fact that support is available. So there was lots of postering in the city, lots of outreach on social media, word of mouth, and they encouraged defendants to get in touch so that they could, you know, be supported with different things so BDS help with like legal work so going through the police footage helping people prepare for court liaison with solicitors attending court hearings and you know like in that moment they'll also do like police station support and you know support people if their house has been raided by the cops and they've like lost their phones and stuff like that and ABC will kind of offer you know like I'll do like pre-prison chats with people because I did some time inside when I was younger so you know a few of us in ABC have been in prison so we like to kind of help people prepare practically and emotionally. Uh, we've also been doing fundraising um, and sharing details of people in prison who've like consented and asked uh, 
to you know to have their details shared that they so that they can receive letters and solidarity and stuff like that and you know and there's also like an element of supporting people's families like uh, you know quite a few defendants have been separated from their kids for example and ideally like when we're a bit less overwhelmed like we really want to play a role in supporting kind of like prisoner resistance and organizing from the defendants who are inside so what at the moment like between abc and bds we we buddy people so someone gets kind of assigned and you make sure that you're like bottom lining the support for that person like you're checking in with them regularly you're going to court with them you're making sure that they have access to to what they need but like beyond those two groups there's also like a lot of kind of autonomous organizing in bristol so people have been organizing like fundraising like bar nights and organizing letter writing events and stuff like that and at the moment there's like a kind of like defense campaign in the making like we want to do something a lot more organized like with defendants and their families and their supporters and counter some of the kind of like state narratives and the mainstream media narratives about the riot and what happened so yeah so that's that's kind of what's been going down so Bristol has a history of radical leftist resistance, at least that I've been aware of, such as a chapter of the IWW or Industrial Workers of the World, those anti-repression projects at Bristol ABC and BDS, an anarchist book fair that actually my co-host William and I were able to attend a few years back, which was awesome. Um, it's also been host to sabotage actions claimed over the last decade by insurrectional anarchists of the informal anarchist federation slash international revolutionary front fai irf against police and capitalist infrastructure so it's kind of like a wide gamut of stuff that's come across my radar as as things that are interesting about bristol and exciting about bristol it seems kind of like a hotbed of anarchy can you talk about like what what the anarchist scene is like in bristol sure so I think to the outside world, it seems like a hotbed. But I think when you've lived there a long time, it feels like a retirement home. But that's probably a bit cheeky. There is like a lot of stuff going on. I think there's like different theories. So my personal theory is that I think Bristol is like big enough to have like a diversity of anarchist tendencies. So there's kind of like these kind of insurrectionary currents. And then there's, you know, groups like the IWW and people that are doing like community organising, like with around housing or wages things like this but it's not as big as like cities like London it's kind of like intimate enough for people to know each other and also like there's been really long-term anarchist infrastructure uh base which is like the local social center um you know it's been it got established in 1995 so wow. it's kind of um part of the furniture really in terms of contributing to the to the like local resistance in the area or there's something in the water I don't know <laughs> I want to get some of that water. Yeah, that <laughs> that seems to make a lot of sense, and that that's a thing that I've I've heard from other people in cities where there's a long-standing activity and and maybe even varied, but but yeah, having that sort of infrastructure that people can plug into and that sort of collective community memory really makes the ability it's something to build off of, which I think is really cool. So folks may recognize the name of Anna Campbell, um, a feminist and anarchist who had been active organizing in Bristol, uh, who fell shaheed or martyr in Kurdish Kermanji while fighting in the Women's Defense Units, or YPG, in Rojava, also known as the Autonomous Administration of Northern and Eastern Syria. Uh, she was killed by a Turkish missile strike, as I understand. Um, I wonder if y'all would talk about... Anna, who had been involved in the IWW, as I understand, and also BDS and Bristol ABC, and a bit about her legacy. Uh, sure. So, yeah, Anna was, I think she was probably involved in every group in Bristol at some point or another. She was, like, really, um, really well-known locally, really active. Um, she was active in Bristol ABC um, and BDS. Um, and... Yeah, she, you know, she just really believed in solidarity, in self-defense, in militant resistance. Like, she definitely wasn't a pacifist. She was really inspired by what was going on in Rojava. And um, obviously, you know, she lost her she lost her life for that. But um, we've all been talking about her a lot with um, the repression because, yeah, she would have just, like, fucking loved it. Like, she would have been all over it, like, coming to court and doing demos and painting banners and spelling them wrong and like all sorts of stuff that she used to do so yeah we really 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 like really really miss her and um yeah it's like it's really hard that she's not around but um but you know she was doing ABC like just before she left so I think it I think it shaped her a lot politically and um I think she could see like the strategic value of doing of supporting prisoner resistance like she organized 
quite a lot around when there was like the big prison strikes in the US in 2016 like she was doing like info events about that and banner drops and she was really inspired by that and um yeah yeah I mean she wasn't technically from Bristol she was from the other side of uh the UK but yeah she she definitely kind of made an impact in the city yeah and and Anna was a, a friend and comrade when um when she lived in that other part of the UK um in 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 Sussex and um I remember her from other struggles, um, from anti-militarist organising and organising in solidarity with the Palestinian anti-colonial struggle, organising against against the G8 summit, and yeah, there, there, there were just so many struggles that that she was involved in. Yeah, thinking about how those struggles have, could move in a more revolutionary direction were, were, was, and also the you know as Nicole mentioned, the the importance of self-defence and people's self-defence were were things that led led her to to join the revolution in Rojava. Thank you for sharing. So I guess switching topics a bit, could you talk about how lockdowns were experienced during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic, what they were like around the UK and maybe in Bristol in particular? Yeah, so um, so in Bristol, as in, in lots of other places around the UK, anarchists were involved in, in, uh, in mutual aid organizing, um, supporting people through the, the, the coronavirus lockdowns. So in Bristol, we, we, uh, we have a project which was established at the, be- the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic called Basin Roses. It was established by the, um, the Anarchist Social Centre in Easton, delivering uh, boxes of food to people who needed it uh, because of the coronavirus lockdown and for, for any other reason. And that's still going on um, as a piece of kind of mutual aid infrastructure in Bristol. There are also solidarity funds set up by mutual aid groups to help people survive through the, through the lockdowns. So yeah, there was this mutual aid response to, to the pandemic and to, uh, you know, the, the fact that people were struggling because of inability to work because of the, the pandemic and the lockdowns. And then there was the, the police's authoritarian use of, um, of the coronavirus legislation to repress dissent and mass mobilisation. So in Bristol, for example, um, the police, um, Avon and Somerset police, increased the use of, of technology like drones um, to su- surveil the population, to spy on people gathering during lockdowns and, you know, just use it as an opportunity to roll out the use of that new kind of repressive technology, which they, they've been wanting to, to use for, for a long time. And they were using it before the lockdown, but they, there was a double in, in, in the use of that kind of technology after the start of the coronavirus lockdowns. And during the coronavirus lockdowns, you had the, uh, the murder of, um, of George Floyd in the US and the, um, like global response, Black Lives Matter response um, of people coming together in anti-racist demonstrations, and Bristol had had some uh, had a really vibrant movement, and people are still um, uh, organising. All Black Lives Bristol have been consistently organising, and and they organised a protest last uh, June, uh, where ten thousand people, so one of the biggest demonstrations in recent memory, were gathered at College Green and marched through the city. And as they came to the, the statue of um, Edward Colston, who was a local personality who was involved in the slave trade, um, who has many things named after him um, in the city, uh, so streets, schools, etc. And people had been campaigning, petitioning for the removal of this statue for, well, for decades. Um, as, as the march went past the, uh, the, the, the Colston statue, people put ropes around the statue and, and it was pulled down by the mass of the people and eventually was, uh, was carried to the River Avon and, and thrown in the river. And like, the pulling down of the Colston statue was an important backdrop to what happened on March the 21st, um, which was when the riot that we're going to be talking about happened. So as the statue was pulled down, police stood back and, and didn't make arrests at that point and chose instead to try to identify people later on and to make arrests later on. And uh, the police chief, Andy, Andy Marsh, said that was to, to avoid a riot taking place. He, he, he thought that if the police had intervened at that point, there would have been a riot. And they were rebuked really harshly by Priti Patel, uh, the Home Secretary, and you know, they were told that they should have intervened, they should have stopped what was happening. And, you know, what happened, you know, was copied around the UK, other statues were removed. Were, were, were removed. And 
yeah, the government was pissed off about that and wanted, uh, you know, wanted a more authoritarian response by the police. Um, so it, that provided a, back, a backdrop to what happened on 21st of March because the police were geared up to respond in a more authoritarian way uh, to the next big mass demonstration, which was against the policing bill. And yeah, I guess, I, I, you know, I guess the, the backdrop to that demonstration was that it came during the UK's harshest coronavirus lockdown. Uh, so the other uh, lockdowns had, uh, some of the other lockdowns had had, had included um, like clauses which said that political protests would be exempt uh, from the terms of the lockdown. Uh, whereas um, in March that th those clauses weren't in place. So uh, the police were, were acting as if uh, protest was completely illegal. In the United States, like in, in, in like North America in general, there's been a lot of back and forth about the right wing having cornered a lot of the anti-lockdown sentiment around the idea that the government is using this as an opportunity to clamp down on people's freedom of movement, freedom of expression, or ability to defend themselves. And like I was talking to a comrade in Germany the other day who we were talking about like how anarchists have engaged in responses to lockdowns or re repression against demonstrations by using public health language in France in a different way than he had seen in Germany and I had seen in the US. I don't know if you had any thoughts you wanted to share about the the framing of of public health measures being used as a way to and and maybe the importance in the framework that we're operating in to decrease the spreading of COVID-19 still living under capitalism, but the use of the of those things to repress people's ability to to live safely and and um, push back against government authoritarian measures. Does that make sense? Yeah. Shall I come in there, Tom? Sure. I think it's been like quite complex in the UK in the sense of like a lot of people that have been like anti-lockdown have been like either like open fascists or kind of like anti-vaxxers kind of conspiracy theory-esque with like like quite strong links to right-wing worldviews and and to like fascist ideas and ideologies but I think people have also I don't know if there's been like enough critique of the state with the lockdown I think I don't know it's like difficult isn't it because obviously we want our communities to like keep each other safe and if the state you know actually gave a fuck about anyone's lives they would shut down the factories and the Amazon warehouses outside Bristol and all of that that are like hot spots for the virus but I do think it's also exposed like a huge amount of kind of like ableism like in anarchist scenes like at the beginning of the pandemic it was really like oh people are you know oh let's suddenly look out for people with chronic illnesses who were like previously pretty kind of like displaced from our communities like if you get sick or you burn out or you have a health issue or a caring responsibility it's like quite difficult to participate in certain struggles because of people's ableism so I think yeah Base of Roses has been like a nice example of how that's been like responded to proactively but I, I think I don't know I think the pandemic's just been this like microcosm of yeah like just like class war right in terms of like how the legislation's used and all the repressive strategies and stuff and I think as time went on and people understood the virus more there was kind of like more willingness to like take to the streets and do demos and like not be as kind of pacified thinking it was like a kind of way of harm reduction do you know what I mean like I was really nervous when all these like big demos were happening because I live with someone who's shielding and that just like made me very nervous but it was also you know really clear that people had to be on the streets and stuff so but yeah I know like anarchists everywhere have been like thinking about this stuff and I probably haven't answered your question but I think there's like tensions in Bristol basically between opinions about this but all obviously everyone is against like the state violence and the state surveillance and the state repression yeah that's totally fair and i, I appreciate you being a perfect answer it's complex <laughs> and here's some of the perspectives that people are coming from and i i appreciate you also pointing to the the ableism that was present continues to be but at least it's like visible around folks immune compromised and and, and related issues so thank you for letting me interject that question 
can you talk a bit more about like what what context the the kill the bill protest emerged from and what did the protest look like okay so i mean the context that the the march the 21st protests emerged from you know was immediately because of the um the policing bill uh but the the wider context is around policing in general um, and and state repression, state authoritarianism in general. So, you know, for instance, you had that huge mobilisation in Bristol in 2020 and the toppling of the Colston statue, but police uh, attacks on, on, on communities in Bristol and in the UK are constant. Policing is racist and racialized in Bristol. If if you're if you're black, for example, you're seven times more likely to be stopped and searched than than if you're not. And, you know, it comes, you know, in the context of, well, this history of, of what Nicole was talking about there, the kind of resistance against against racist policing in Bristol and in the UK. So, you know, earlier that year in, in, in 2021, so two people or at least two people have been killed in custody close to Bristol. So in January, um, a 24 year old man called Mohammed Hassan died after having been detained at Cardiff Bay Police Station. Uh, not so far away from Bristol. And again, not so far away, five weeks later, another young man called uh, Maya Bashir uh, died um, in police custody, this time in, in Newport, um, so both in South Wales. And that's the, that's the norm um, in, in terms of police violence. So since since 1990s, you know, around 1,800 people, and, and this is recorded cases, around 1,800 people have died uh, in police custody or or directly after being in police custody in, in, in the UK. And so, yeah, the backdrop is this um, really harsh uh, coronavirus lockdown where, where protest is, uh, is illegal. And at the beginning of 2021, the government passed the Spy Corps bill. So, you know, at, at a time when it was very difficult for people to, um, to express dissent because of this lockdown that was going on, um, and the Spy Cops Bill basically was the state's response to the ongoing legal cases that have been brought by by women um, who've had intimate relationships with undercover police officers who posed as as people that were involved in in the radical left and you know had had relationships with with them on this this false pretext. So there's a, currently a, an inquiry going on about the. Uh, undercover policing tactics that that were used, but the spy cops bill made it ex- expressly legal, so li- legal, not not illegal, for state agents um, working for the police or for other state authorities. You know, could even extend to things like local authorities to break the law. So it was essentially passing a piece of legislation which um, would make it legal for, for police officers to break the law in the future if if they were on undercover duty. So the, the state had done this um, kind of under the cover of the coronavirus pandemic and lockdowns. So the next thing that the state wanted to push through Parliament was the Police Courts and Sentencing Bill. It was kind of the most, I, I would say, the most repressive piece of legislation since the the criminal justice and public order act of the 1990s again it was like being done at a time when political dissent was very very difficult and the bill itself criminalizes the livelihoods of um, gypsy roma and traveler communities gives the police some increased powers to seize vehicles and also creates a criminal offense of trespass again um which is an attack on the livelihoods of travelling people and a further attack on on squatters and and, and generally on freedom in the UK. It introduces longer sentences, um, which can be imposed on people and particularly uh, for young people. So it allows allows younger people to be sent to prison for longer. So the bill gives police more powers to shut down and to impose conditions on public protests and processions. It widens police powers to arrest people for causing a public nuisance. It allows cops to um, impose conditions on protests if if the cops think that the protest is, is too noisy or disruptive and it allows them to shut down protest encampments too. Uh, so it has a massive effect on on protests in the UK. And the other side of the coin um, is the state's new prison expansion programme to create 18,000 new prison places in the UK. 
I don't know if you want to talk about that, Nicole. Yeah, so so yeah, like a, a, a kind of major part of the bill, which I think hasn't had as much attention as as uh, like the other the other kind of areas of harm is um, the British state want to build eighteen thousand new prison places through a series of mega prisons, which will most likely be run by private companies, and this legislation gives them the opportunity to criminalise more and more people, um, and also to keep people in prison for much longer than they already are. Uh, so yeah it's pretty kind of like significant in the context of like the prison industrial complex like more broadly in the UK. The final straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. You will never ever surrender or compromise! We occupied government buildings, we blockaded highways and we talked about not just marching but direct action to shut the shit down! Yate, we invite you to join us for Indigenous Action, a podcast where we dig deep into critical issues impacting our communities in the occupied lands known as the so-called United States or what many people recognize as Turtle Island. This is an autonomous, anti-colonial broadcast with unapologetic and claws out analysis towards total liberation. So take your seat by this fire and may the bridges we burn together light our way. Feel that fire so it's a blazing, blazing fire that they can never stop. Find us at indigenousaction.org and with the Channel Zero Network. And it seems like a... I guess outside of the shape of the bill, um, part of the part of the context or one of the sparks that really would have lit people and sent them into the street was the the situation of um, Sarah Everard. Would you mind talking about that? Sure. Yes. So quite a quite a like inflammatory situation in the UK that was creating a lot of like rage and despair in people was that a police officer in early March was arrested for for murdering a woman called Sarah Everard. And I don't know if people know the case at all. I've seen it on the news, but um, he was a, a police officer called Wayne Cousins and he showed his badge and used the coronavirus legislation to to get his to get Sarah into his car. And then he later uh, raped and murdered her. And so, you know, this was like a really big deal. And there was like quite shortly organised like a huge vigil in London. And on this vigil, there were like thousands of people protesting. And again, using the coronavirus legislation, the police tried to repress the demo, including holding women down and assaulting them, which in the context was like pretty horrifying. So it was only one week after this vigil in London that the big Kill the Bill march took place in Bristol. So there was like a lot of kind of like anger about the police like in the air. And then in terms of the, you know, the actual demo and the riot, I actually had a like a 38 and a half degree fever at home so I thought I had COVID so I wasn't there but um you know obviously like the footage got shared like all over social media and that like all over the world but there was like a really big uh big march and then um people started like moving towards the police station towards the towards the kind of evening time and um the the police station's like right in the city centre and yeah like police officers like attacked the crowd with batons and riot shields like pepper spray was used people charged with police horses some people were bitten by police dogs and you know people really like defended themselves like seized riot shields um grabbed helmets and batons to defend themselves and yeah by the end of the night like windows of the police station had been smashed there was like various like vehicles on fire like police vehicles there was also some like famous like very bristol related photographs shared of like one kid like uh skateboarding like next to this like burning cop van which uh went pretty <laughs> viral on the internet uh yeah so yeah it got it got pretty pretty wild west and i think it's um it's important to understand what what happens um like in uh, from the perspective of of, of the community's self defence um, against authoritarian policing and the police itself, uh, which is constantly attacking the community in Bristol and, and 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 all of our communities. So you know the the legal system tries to 
you know, it tries to understand self-defense in a much more limited way. Um, if you argue, if you argue that you're defending yourself when when you're being attacked by the police, you know, in a court of law, um, it's going to be all about whether or not the, you know, you were threatened at that point. But I think we should understand self-defense in a much more broad way. Uh, that we, you know, we need to defend our communities against state against state oppression. And you know, I have to say, I'm really proud to live in a community where people people did defend themselves in that way and uh, yeah like that's that's one of the the points that we've we've we've, we've made as um abc and bds um is that we're proud of of the of the defendants and their resistance another unscripted question just out of curiosity though like i know in the so-called us one thing that was experienced and has been growing over the last few years but last year really sort of blew up the idea of or just made it super visible and part of discourse the idea of abolition in general but abolition of the police and i know that within the u.s context and the white supremacist anti-black like former more recently slave state that's still pretty contested especially around the structure of prisons and, and racialization in the u.s that's a lot of terms sorry but that like abolition has like a weight to it i think that in a lot of other places it would not but Around this time, you know, when it becomes all the more blatant what the state is doing, whipping out its police forces and, you know, these clear instances of police murders, like those ones in January in in the area and also um, Sarah Everett and the, the impunity of the pig in that instance, like has abolitionism or has just getting rid of the police moved from outside of subcultural discuss- discourse or yeah, is, is, are people have people talked about this have they said like oh this is a clear sign that this is what the police do we're just seeing it right in front of our faces right now yeah like i think there's been like this kind of like abolitionist uh tendency that's been growing and growing and last year definitely escalated everything I remember doing one webinar about uh resisting prison expansion with a group called community action on prison expansion and there was like 400 people watching it. Like it was pretty wild, like how many people got interested. And like, unfortunately, there was a bit of a sensation of like abolition is like the flavor of the week, if that makes sense. And yeah. I don't know how many people will like continue to do consistent prisoner support, for example. But I think the interesting thing about the COVID time was that for people who kind of through privilege hadn't you know experienced state violence, like suddenly everyone was like witnessing the power of the state if that makes sense so like working class communities people of color like other people that have historically experienced state violence who were like a lot more on side about like criticizing the police you know suddenly you just had like the general population like thinking about it and i think there definitely is still like quite a strong like anti-police energy you know it's it's easy isn't it to be in sort of like left-wing kind of echo chambers but i think I think there really is like a sensation now in the UK of where people are, are talking about abolition, like a lot more, yeah, like weightily, as you said. Yeah, I also went to Zoom meetings that were um, that were attended by many, many people during the summer of 2020, um, talking about abolition. Um, but just linking it back to to the riot, so you know, one of the most beautiful things about the riot was uh, the one of the last police cars to be set on fire before it was set on fire, um, had the words defund the police uh, written across the bonnet. Um, so, you know, clearly the people who, um, who, who, who who were fighting back against the police on that night, you know, did have those, those, those ideas and, and, and those visions um, uh, in their minds. So I guess with the folks that caught charges, I, th- I think one of you had mentioned that folks are still being charged, but can you talk about the defendants? Can you talk about what kind of charges and times that they face? What stages of conviction are they in? And and also, most of our audience is based in the U.S., and the criminal justice system has a specific shape to it here in terms of how the court process goes. And I'm wondering if you could sort of highlight some some differences or some instances that would uh, enlighten us to what the defendants are facing in Bristol courts? Yes. So 81 people have been arrested so far. And of the people arrested, uh, the vast majority um, are pretty young, mostly in their early 20s. And as Nicole said, um, you know, some people have been involved in 
in in our movements but but many hadn't so you know it was it was a challenge uh to to get in contact with people and to you know to establish connections with them um for bds and abc 41 of those 81 people have been charged now um so so what happens in the when you get arrested in in, in the uk is um you get arrested taken to the police station and you you might be charged uh at the police station or you might be released on on police bail or released under investigation so if one of the latter two happens uh it it means you haven't been charged yet the police are still considering whether to charge you and and to prosecute you almost everybody i think wasn't arrested on the evening of the 21st of march so after the riot happened the police released photographs uh of of people that they you know they trawled through cctv footage um and they released photographs of of people who they said had been involved in the rioting and yeah there was lots of snitching that took place um so the footage and the photographs of 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 people that were wanted were put on the tv they were also released in on on the front pages of of um national newspapers and there was some snitching that happened where where, where people called the cops and, and said oh my neighbor or, or or something like that is was involved in the rioting and yeah it has to be pointed out like the complicity of the mainstream media in doing the police's work for them in, in putting out the photos of, of of people in order for the, for them to be repressed by the state so 41 people have been charged and they've been being brought to court over over the last month since since March three people are currently on remand in prison so being on remand means that you've you've gone to you've gone to a court hearing and uh, the judge has um, has refused to give you bail and you're in prison awaiting awaiting your trial um so people can wait you know for for a year or more um for 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 their trial to take place um and remain in prison for that entire time. Ten people have already been sentenced for the, for the riot. So those who've pled, pled guilty to riot have received sentences of between three and five years in prison. And the remaining people have, have, have all pled not guilty. And so their cases will be between now. So the first case is next week um, of, a, of a guy called Ryan Roberts. Um, he's on. He's in court in Bristol Crown Court on the 25th of October. And his case lasts until the 27th of October. Um, he's charged with riot and arson. Riot carries a um, maximum sentence of 10 years. Uh, the judge in in the cases is is saying that the starting point for sentencing is is six years, and arson carries a variable sentence that, uh, depending on the level of the arson, but can be a very serious uh, charge also. So it's a serious case, and Ryan has called for solidarity, um, and he wants to make the case as political as he possibly as he possibly can, and he wants demonstrations outside the court. Um, we're calling for people to pack the courtroom to show that there's support for people to fighting back against police violence and defending themselves against against the police. Uh, so that's next week. There's also two demonstrations planned next week on the 25th and 27th in solidarity with Ryan. Yeah, the rest of the trials are scheduled um, between January uh, 2022 and July 2022. But people are still being charged. So that the people who are currently released under investigation are still going on people going on being charged and unfortunately people are still being arrested also um so the police are saying that they, there's many more people that are wanted and yeah unfortunately people go on uh, people are c- carrying on being arrested so you know we can see that it's a it's a long slog in terms of anti-repression work and in terms of supporting our comrades going through this process of the state trying to de- trying to repress them and kind of the narrative which has come out in bristol actually is is um so far really the state's narrative so when people have been sentenced in court after they've pled guilty the judge has reeled out a long kind of list of injuries sustained by the police a long list of, of statements by the police saying that they were traumatized by people fighting back against them at the same time you know when the riot happened um pretty patel the, the home secretary again made statements to the effect that the people who rioted were thugs the avon and somerset police called people a pack of wild animals uh the mayor of bristol uh, also kind of condemned people for rioting i like that, that wild animals quote 
quite like that. <laughs> we should do a t-shirt with that to the effect of that or something. It's a good fundraiser. I think it was a mob of wild animals. Yeah. <laughs> can have all the West Country wildlife, all the foxes and badgers. Nice. Oh, okay. nice. <laughs> <laughs> so what we have is kind of a narrative uh, really set at the moment, unfortunately, by, by people with the most power. You know, what, we're, what, we, what we need to do is to put forward our own narrative, is to show that the people in Bristol uh, support people for fighting back against the police, that, we, that, that we're proud of these people who fought back. And we also need to talk about, you know, the police violence um, on the 21st of March against, against the people who, who uh, surrounded Bridewell. So, you know, not only on the 21st of March, but afterward, uh, the police attack people, as Nicole was saying, they smash riot shields over, over people's heads. They attack people with batons, attack people with dogs. And, you know, that, that police violence needs to be, um, needs to be centred to. Or we hope that will come out through the different types of anti-repression work that we were talking about through, um, through the work of BDS and ABC, but also through the defence campaign and, and through you know, through the evidence of defendants in, 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 in court cases. So, so, so Ryan, um, as I said, is, is, he wants, he wants to make his case as political as possible, and that means talking about the police violence and talking about the violence levelled against people on, on the evening. And, yeah, I mean, I'd, I alluded just then to, um, to what happened after the 21st of March, so that's probably worth talking about. So there was a series of demonstrations which happened after the 21st of March in Bristol. So... Kill the Bill demonstrations continued um, two or three times weekly. And, you know, for the first few weeks at least, we were met by an army of riot police who were intent on revenge for the, tw the 21st of March. So, you know, a few days after the 21st of March, there was a um, gathering by um, supporters of Gypsy, Roma and Tra Traveller people on College Green that was violently attacked by the cops and, um, you know, a line of riot police uh, charged the, the entire gathering um, of people in tents, et cetera. And uh, again, kind of slammed riot shields down on people's heads. And that was kind of, that set the scene really for, for the policing over, over the next weeks and months where the cops, uh, you know, really tried to exact revenge for what, what had happened on the 21st of March by using the maximum amount of violence against people when they were coming out on, st on on the streets in Bristol to um, to resist against the bill, yeah, maybe I can add add one mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, and I think it's worth saying with the defendants that, um, like, again, it's like quite mixed in terms of in terms of like class and race. Um, but the people that are getting like smashed with the hardest sentences are are working class people who have had like previous convictions or who weren't in touch with us, who went guilty, for example, due to like terrible legal advice and they thought they were only going to get a couple of months and instead they got, you know, like four or five years. So I think it's always worth, you know, the riot itself was like politically motivated in like lots of ways, but, you know, kind of defendant support, it like always crosses into different terrains you know like it's it is like a class issue and a race issue and like the people who will get smashed are those that don't have like the same level of mitigation and part of the kind of like defense campaign goals are to support people so that they don't make like cutthroat defenses so they don't set up narratives of good protesters and bad protesters we recently had a film screening of the submedia film about uh, the j20 mm -hmm. resistance and, and while it's like quite different context, I think it did inspire quite a lot of the defendants of how maybe without that sort of political support and education, they might have gone down the route of being like kind of good protester. I'm a good citizen. I didn't mean anything by it. And, and I think it's nice to see people like collectively becoming kind of like a bit more empowered and radicalized like through this process. And I'm hoping long term that it will just backfire, you know, against the state like Bristol's already a very radical place and now we're going to have people organising prisoner resistance on the inside that we can support. We're going to have like a, an army of young people that have been dragged through the court system who, you know, who want to fight back. So, um, yeah, I think the the defendant work is kind of like quite interesting in that way. Yeah, that's awesome. 
This is the final straw, and you're hearing Tom and Nicole of Bristol ABC talk about the defendants from the Kill the Bill riot of March of 2021. The riots across the UK in 2011 that Tom references are those in the aftermath of the police murder of Mark Duggan in Tottenham in North London. Yeah, and just to say in terms of the number of people sentenced, so um, 10 people have received sentences now to a total of 29 years in prison between them. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say another bit of the context of um, of all this is um, it's against the backdrop of the riots um, across the, the UK in 2011, which were really widespread um, by working class communities, predominantly and people of colour. And like, I think one one criticism of um, kind of response by anarchists to, 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 to those riots is that we really, really failed to provide um, infrastructure and support the people that were arrested. There was a really strong kind of state narrative. You know, you had you had Boris Johnson um, going out with his broom and 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 saying that, you know, everyone should be part of this riot clear up. So there was a strong state narrative that was kind of kind of saying that um, the, the rioters weren't political, that it was kind of, you know, again, like kind of thuggery or, or whatever. And um, Sadly, I think actually people kind of bought that a little bit, I'm afraid. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, with what's going on now with building infrastructure for um, for supporting the people arrested on 21st of March, I really hope that, that we can do better uh, in supporting people than, 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 than we did back in 2011. That's not to say, by the way, that nobody organised back in 2011. There was some really, really good defence, that, that there were some good attempts at defence and solidarity organising, but what, what was really needed was was unconditional solidarity for those in court um, on a really, really large scale, and that didn't materialise. It's, I mean, it's refreshing to hear people taking those sorts of lessons, though, and saying this is like we we lacked then, we've learned, we we're trying to do this now, and being able to take the like examples of international situations or, or situations in other countries, and like that's that's really impressive. You had mentioned that Ryan was calling for uh, people to come out and demonstrate. Um, there's demonstrations on the 25th and 27th, and uh, folks are going to try to pack the courthouse. For folks that can't make it, whether because they're abroad or um, ability or what have you, can you talk a little bit about um, other ways that they can offer solidarity, both to Ryan's case and upcoming ones, ways that folks can donate towards legal costs or survival needs of of the defendants moving forward or i don't know dropping banners in front of embassies and such abroad if that's helpful yeah sure so i mean like there is there is like an international call for solidarity and you know we'd like we'd just appreciate any any crews any groups any organizations making that stuff happen so it could be writing statements it could be doing banner pictures it could be dedicating actions to him um, also, you know, things like letter writing, you know, there's like a bunch of people in prison now and, you know, they're kind of new to prison. Right. So like this is a critical time for support of getting loads of posts and feeling, you know, a lot of the defendants, you know, have felt a bit of shame about their involvement. Maybe they've had shame from their family and the media, but showing them inside that like loads of people on the outside support them and have their back is like really important so yeah we've got a list of a list of prisoners and their addresses on the ABC site we do circulate graphics as well but it's always worth checking the site because people get moved to prison a lot and stuff like that and yeah like funds are constantly needed we send every prisoner like at least 50 pounds a month money is going to people's families to books to clothes and sometimes for like legal costs as well so uh, Bristol Defendant Solidarity have a crowdfunder for for legal costs and, and ABC also has a crowdfunder for, for prisoner support funds. Yes, yeah, so there's definitely like loads of loads of ways that people can can offer support. And maybe it's worth saying that. Um, so I think the response to those crowdfunders is really encouraging. It shows the level of support from from people in Bristol and people outside for the defendants. We've raised over forty five thousand, but um, the amount of money that's needed to um, you know provide financial support to people in prison and, and all the different types of support that Nicole mentions is really is really considerable, especially over over the length of time that some people might might be serving in prison. So, 
yeah, we'd really encourage people internationally to uh, to donate to those crowdfunders. Like I mentioned, it's it's heartwarming to hear about y'all taking lessons from from cases of repression and people resisting and organizing in other places. What are some lessons or some takeaways that that you'd like people listening to this to to come back with and that you're learning right now through this process? So I think one of the key takeaways is that it's like worth building infrastructure now. Like obviously repression and state violence is like ongoing in every community. But I think Bristol, we had a kind of slight advantage on other cities in the UK, for example, because we've got that infrastructure like ABC and BDS. Um, you know, lots of challenges come up when organizing, right? And if you've already got like an established like group and affinity with each other and systems like that really helps. So um, there's like a zine uh, about how to start an anarchist black cross group that's got advice and resources and stuff if people are interested in starting at ABC. And the other thing is like, I think we haven't mentioned it much, but like, you know, repression like really takes its toll on people. And that support does need to be like holistic. Like it's not just, you know, doing like legal work for people. It is also like offering emotional support. So um, there was like an emotional support group, which is kind of uh, transformed a little bit now because I think defendants prefer to talk to people like one-to-one. So we're paying for... For, co- for counseling and therapy um, with some comrades that's really helping people um, and even just you know in terms of like people's health and stress and like herbal support things like that like I think yeah it's really good to to really kind of humanize people and realize that like the defendants are experiencing like a really stressful time you know like they don't know what's going to happen with their lives they don't know if they're going to get eight years in prison or two years in prison they don't know if they'll be able to get a job in the future you know like their relationships are getting trashed like maybe their children have gone into care like there's so many effects of state violence that we kind of invisibilize and like I don't want us to come across that we're kind of like rubbing our hands as anarchists of like oh yeah sweet there's been this like uprising in Bristol and it's like really politically exciting like actually it's been like really awful and traumatic for loads of the defendants you know, especially people that already experienced domestic violence who are then getting like beaten by male police officers, for example. Um, so, yeah, so I think having that kind of like broad overview is really important. And then if people do not know the film, there is an absolutely ridiculous, highly problematic, but hilarious film called Hot Fuzz. So if you want to take the piss out of Avon and Somerset Police, like it's based in the West Country in England, um, you should watch it because it's like the best film in terms of like laughing at our local cops. Yeah, I was just going to say about the um, the kind of effects of of repression, the emotional re- effects of repression. So you know, w- when I was going through a trial 10, 12 years ago, like the tactics that the cops used in the run up to the trial were were kind of designed to separate us from our comrades um, through bail conditions saying that we couldn't speak to people and we're designed to make life as difficult uh, for us as possible through house raids through um, through arrests intended to come up with reasons to remand us in prison etc and I guess that really impressed on me the need for for prisoner solidarity and I think you know the thing that really impressed on me um, the, 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 the the need for yeah solidarity um for people going through repression was just you know seeing several comrades like really really go through hard times and you know even you know a couple of those comrades aren't aren't, aren't with us any anymore and you know just just seeing the need to um to have that infrastructure there to um you know to 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 have the backs of people that are, that are going through this state repression and you know i think that's a real motivation for for a lot of us so in relation to the, the bill and the Black Lives Matter protests, there was all, also the swim that the statue of Edward Colston decided to take. I wonder if you could please tell us about the, the four folks that are facing heavy charges and repression for alleged involvement in that. Yeah, I mean, four people are facing charges for the toppling of the statue. Um, and there's been like a massive campaign in Bristol to support them. Yeah, one thing I didn't say in relation to the bill is that uh, one of the parts of the uh, the policing bill makes the uh, damaging of national monuments um, punishable by ten years in prison. Um, so that was specifically in in response to um, to the toppling of Colston and the toppling of other statues around the UK. So that's part of the state's like repressive response. But yeah, so there's a massive campaign 
in support of, um, of, of the four people who are arrested after the toppling of that statue. And they're going to be in court um, for several weeks from the 13th of December. So there are demonstrations being called at the start of that court case. Um, and there's also th- th- there's fundra- fundraising taking place and public events taking place in Bristol, which you can find out about on the Bristol Defendant Solidarity Twitter account. So, yeah, that's also a focus of, um, of solidarity work this this year. Finally, another case of repression that's been um, in the news recently is uh, the prosecution in Bristol of Toby Schoen, who the state has identified as the web admin, I believe, of the anarcho-nihilist website 325.nostate.net. It was taken down alongside other insurrectionary and counter-info anarchist sites from around the world by pigs in the Netherlands. Can you all talk about Toby's prosecution, the level of international collaboration between police forces in different countries and how people can support Toby? Sure. So it's worth it's worth saying that the terrorism charge that Toby was arrested on was dropped due to lack of evidence. So it's all kind of like alleged in terms of like his alleged role in that website. But yeah, he was raided quite violently and remanded earlier this year in prison and was recently sentenced this uh, last week uh, to three years, nine months for drugs charges relating to like mushrooms and I think other other drugs um, that he uses to kind of self-medicate around um, like cancer and depression and things. So, yeah, I think the like the terror- terrorism related charges were dropped mostly. But he, you know, he's happy for his details to be shared. And yeah, I know it's his birthday on the 20th of October. So people can send some birthday cards to him. We'll, we'll put his address in the show notes. Nicole and Tom, uh, unless there's anything else, I really appreciate the conversation that we've had and the work that you all do. Oh, thank you for all your hard work, like putting out this really consistent, amazing show that people should support. Thank you much. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting us and and yeah, for, um, for making the amazing podcast. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say, what you say, what you say, what? I am so tired of hearing about COVID. I feel like I'm drowning in COVID babble. It's everywhere. Oversaturation. I mean, I get it. This thing continues killing people, disrupting the global order, blah, blah, blah. But I see it on TV and I change the channel. I see it on the next channel and I change that one too. And it could be that there's valuable information that I'm missing, something about newer, deadlier strains that I should know, or new symptoms that really turn people into real zombies. But I don't care. I really don't care. I've come to the point where, and I don't know, maybe this is unhealthy. I've come to the point where I've accepted that this super cold is either going to circle back around and kill me or it ain't. And when I say that, I'm not being flippant. This isn't bravado, like, look at me, I'm not afraid of death. I'm someone who truly loves life. And, you know, even in the custody of ruthless fascist fart goblins, I find joy in life. But I've become so conditioned over this experience of the pandemic that I now accept that my imminent demise is just a routine feature of modern life now. I know. That's f***ed up. So I got to pondering that. I imagine I'm not alone. I imagine a lot of you out there feel similar ways. Well, except for you over there in the easy chair with the candy bar. Dude, put on some pants. No one wants to see that. Anyway, what that got me thinking about. Humans are the most adaptable creatures on the planet. We really are good at improvising on the go. We've got natural tools for that, including these big, big brains. That's how we've been around for four million years, give or take. Of course, early on we were hairier and shorter and stinkier, and we fornicated in the mud. In the modern era, we only fornicate in the mud at outdoor concerts, like Woodstock or Lollapalooza. Lollapalooza is still a thing, isn't it? Anyway, we're really adaptable. We get accustomed to changes, and maybe in some ways that's a bad thing. 
Maybe we adapt too easily to warmer temperatures and rising oceans, and that we don't see danger. We simply expect the polar bear to be more like us, migrate to the city and get an office job and start paying for seal. No such thing as a free lunch, pal. And we adapt too easily to the terrible and critical symptoms that arise as a result of swivelization. Early on in swivelization, warfare and invasion became normal features of life. Tribal life didn't have it because the population was spread out with plenty of elbow room. Intertribal warfare was more like occasional skirmishes, more like a football game than the modern warfare. But invasion and war became a norm, and we got used to it. It's just something to live with. Then famine, drought, economic crises, high suicide rates, crime, terrorism, school shootings, genocide, all staples of civilized life. These things arise and we adapt, and then these things become normal. Now the normal includes the occasional rolling pandemic that might wipe us out. Experts are predicting a pandemic that will come along with something like a 30% mortality rate, something like smallpox or the Spanish flu or whatever other plague that circulated before Al Gore invented the Internet. They predict we'll drop like flies, bodies everywhere, social systems collapsing, just mourning and grief and suffering and dying and doom. I hear that and I think, well, those of us who survive will get used to it. At some point, we won't turn on the news and learn the death rates. The news will tell us the life rates. Not because of a new optimism, but just because it's easier to count the heads of everyone who didn't sputter up today. And if past is prologue, we won't find that to be intolerable. We'll just get bored hearing about it. Because we're very adaptive, maybe too adaptive. I mean, think about this. Life has gotten so miserable, and the future looks so bleak. We have billionaires blasting into space as if to find a solution, a new planet to go trash. We're actually conditioned to pin our hopes on these greedy profit predators and their interstellar joyride plans. Life has gotten so terrible, we're waiting for the capitalist masters to develop a planetary exit strategy. Newsflash to all of you non-billionaires out there, but even if these new modern space cowboys do find a way to survive on Mars, they won't be sending us a shuttle back. They'll be sending us a postcard. Hey, Earth, it's us billionaires on Mars letting you know we got here safe. And we can see your planet burning from here. Good luck. And even with the planet burning, we'll, we'll adapt. We'll just shuffle foot to foot as we navigate through the blazing world, like those koalas in the Australian forest fires, the few who survived, smoldering and wide-eyed with their fur singed away. Street vendors are selling oxygen in China. That's normal. We can adapt to anything. You know, maybe we shouldn't. Like German villagers in World War II, we've grown accustomed to life in the shadow of the concentration camp's crematorium. It won't be long before the ashes falling on the brims of our hats are our own. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain back at the super duper uber mega hyper ultra turbo multi uh, let me try that again. You have <laughs> one minute remaining. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain back at the super duper uber mega hyper ultra turbo multi maxi max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're tired of adopting to the new normals, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A243. 205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio 44505 If you'd like to see some of his writings check out 
easy ways to get a hold of his books or make donations to his legal support, you can visit seanswain.org. If you like what we do here here at The Final Straw and want to support our ongoing efforts and transcription of each episode, consider a one-time or ongoing donation or purchasing merch via the options listed at https colon slash slash tfsr.wtf slash support or by clicking the donate link on our website. No money? No problem. Contact us, follow and share us on social media, tell your friends and comrades about us, and rate and follow us on some of the links at https colon slash slash tfsr.wtf slash links or wherever you find us and if you have a community radio station in your area that you'd want to hear us broadcast on as always reach out to us and or them and check out https colon slash slash tfsr.wtf slash radio or our radio tab for more information on how to get started this is the final straw and i'm bursa goodness this show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at the Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop. 